Dial 999 for an ambulance and the sound of that siren should be instantly reassuring. But what if there's no paramedic on board and staff who've had just a few days of medical training? An investigation by this programme has discovered a surge in private ambulances across the country, sending out crews with the bare minimum of training, sometimes not even qualified to administer drugs. It's starting to happen on NHS vehicles too, and it could be putting patient safety at risk. This week we've been investigating the state of the health service. With our final report tonight, here's our health and social care correspondent, Victoria MacDonald. The sound of the siren and the sight of the ambulance racing through the streets is reassurance that help is on its way. Or is it? I think people automatically trust um, people in an ambulance. They assume they know best, they assume they're very well medically qualified. I was mean, just crying out for some, somebody to take the pain away, really, of which obviously they couldn't do. Emergency ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? The sheer number of people dialing 999 and asking for an ambulance has increased by more than 50% in the past decade. And the knock-on effect has been here in hospitals, accident and emergency units, which are at breaking point. But now Channel 4 News has learned how ambulance trusts are dealing with this pressure and it is deeply worrying. A Channel 4 News investigation has found that ambulances are answering 999 calls without paramedics on board. And in parts of the UK, there's been a surge of private ambulance crews attending emergencies. Some of them have only five days medical training, all of which begs the question, who's answering your call? It is easy for the public to be confused. They all wear the green uniform. But paramedics have had at least two years training and are independently regulated. 999 calls, though, are being answered by emergency medical technicians who have just 12 weeks training. And emergency care assistants, they're trained for up to nine weeks in the NHS, but in the private sector, this can be as little as four weeks, three of those spent on their driving skills. Crucially, neither the technicians nor the care assistants are allowed to administer drugs such as morphine and can only give limited treatment to patients. Jo Stevens' mother, Carol, had been suffering from multiple sclerosis for over five years when she came from Spain to see her family in Kent last October. During a visit to the local bowling alley, Carol fell out of her wheelchair onto her knees as well as hitting her head. So they dialed 999 and the reassuring green uniforms of the ambulance crew turned up to check her over. As far as she told me, they said, we think you've just pulled your tendons because you're not used to your legs being bent that way. Um, and you probably don't need to go to hospital, so they didn't take it to hospital. Believing there was no cause for concern, Carol Stevens and her husband felt it was safe enough to drive back to Spain. But eight days after the accident, she still had pain in her legs. My dad rang me and said, look, we've taken mum into hospital and they've discovered she's actually got two broken legs. Um, and the doctors in Spain were absolutely horrified that it had been missed. I was just astounded, really, and obviously really worried for my mum and thinking that she'd obviously was in a huge amount of pain. At one point when she was being turned, she sort of said she could feel her bones crunching, which was just horrible. By this stage, she'd also developed an inflammation of the colon and further complications. Just one day after Jo had returned from visiting her mother in Spain, her father called to say that Carol was declining rapidly. My dad said, you look, there's nothing they can do for her. They think she's, she's going to die soon. And I just... When I spoke to my dad, I said, look, just, just let her know it's OK to go. Um, I didn't want her to hang on and wait for me if she was suffering. Sixteen days after her accident, Carol Stevens died in hospital. Yet it was only when she complained to the South East Coast Ambulance Trust that Joe discovered it was a private ambulance which had answered the call and there was not a paramedic on board. The crew were instead a technician and an assistant. The Ambulance Trust itself conducted an investigation and to add to the Stevens's anguish, the crew later claimed that Carol had actually refused to go to hospital, something they dispute. I felt quite insulted, I think, because it did feel like they shifted the blame to Mum and how much they apologised. They ultimately were saying that she refused to go to hospital and, and we don't believe that. 
The private ambulance company ERS Medical said in response to Channel 4 News that they had engaged fully and transparently with the investigation from the outset. The clinical assessment was undertaken by an NHS trained and qualified ambulance technician who has over 10 years frontline ambulance experience both in the NHS and private sector. ERS Medical are one of a growing number of private and voluntary ambulance companies increasingly being relied upon to keep the 999 service on the road. Using the Freedom of Information Act, we've learned that in the east of England the number of responses more than doubled in the space of three years. In the southeast, it more than tripled in that time. And in London, just 45 emergency responses came from private ambulance services in 2010. By March this year, that had risen to nearly 35,000, although some of that is likely to be because of the Olympics. The use of private ambulances is to meet the, the demands on the service in a way that ensures we maintain a safe ambulance service for the population. Um, and I think that's really important that we take into account the rises in demand so no ambulance service is deliberately setting out to have to use private ambulances. It's not only private ambulances who turn up without paramedics though, it happens in the NHS as well, which means that all but the most basic treatment has to wait for the backup to arrive. Just had my, my, my bone break really and um, and so obviously straight away went down and was screaming in pain. Mark Thompson, who's a teacher, was playing football near Hull when he broke his leg in two places and dislocated his ankle. 999 was called, but it took 30 minutes for an ambulance to arrive. Um, and when they told me that they, they couldn't give me anything and they was waiting for a paramedic to arrive, um, I would just say I was confused more than anything else because my impression was that with them being in an ambulance, surely they could give me some morphine for some pain relief. But they couldn't. As with Carol Stevens, it was a technician and a care assistant who turned up to treat Mark. Neither of them allowed to give morphine. So a paramedic had to be called, and that took another 20 minutes. In response, Yorkshire Ambulance Service said... We would like to reassure the public that we're committed to providing responsive and high quality care to people in Yorkshire and patient care and safety remains our highest priority. As with all emergency incidents, the nearest available crew was dispatched to Mark Thompson. As part of our A&E workforce plans, we intend to employ an extra 450 paramedics at the Trust over the next five years. Whether it's life-threatening or simply agonising, the expectation is that when 999 is dialed, the experts will come, the people trained to deal with whatever confronts them. And that is what, ten months later, still pains Joe Stevens so much, that the experts did not come, that they were not there for her mother. If she'd gone to hospital, they would have picked up straight away that she had two broken legs and, you know, she would have been treated in time and she might still be here. And that report was directed by Hannah Livingston.